In this video, we'll look at how deep learning works on sequences. We won't spend a lot of time on which specific layers we can use on sequences. Instead, we'll work from the outside in, looking at the basic structure of sequence models first. And then in the next video, we'll look at an example of the type of layer you might use in a sequence-based model. The basic idea of sequence models is very similar to that of other deep learning models, but the main characteristic is that we need to ensure that the model can handle input sequences of different lengths. We'll feed the model with raw data with no feature extraction so that we don't lose any information. We'll then define something called a sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer, which will form the basic structure of our model. And then finally, we'll look at how to produce output. This can either be a new sequence based on the input sequence or a single vector if we're doing sequence classification or sequence regression. And in this video, we'll look at each of these three stages of the model in detail. As before, if you're actually implementing these things, you'll need a little bit more technical detail than we'll discuss in this video. You can go to dlvu.github.io to see our lectures that we give in the master's course deep learning where we discuss the same subject, but provide some of the finer details as well. The first question is how do we represent our inputs? As we've seen previously, when we want to do deep learning, our input should be represented as a tensor, preferably in a way that retains all information present in the input data. Here's an example. To encode a simple monophonic musical sequence, we can just one-hot encode the notes. This gives us seven one-hot vectors for the seven possible notes, and we can just string these together in a sequence to represent a sequence of notes. And in natural language, we can do the same thing for characters, or even for words. And we can view a sequence of vectors as a two tensor or a matrix, which means that we can easily represent such sequences in a deep learning system. One thing, however, is different from what we've seen so far in deep learning data. If we have multiple sequences of different lengths, this leads to a data set of matrices of different sizes. In principle, this is not a problem because we want to build models that can handle sequences of different lengths. However, when we batch our data to use it in mini-batched gradient descent, it's important for efficient computation that all instances in the batch have the same length. To achieve this, we can pad out the shorter sequences in the batch to match the length of the longest sequence. And this padding can be done with a special extra token or simply with vectors containing only zeros. At this point, we have translated a batch of input sequences into a three tensor, which we can feed to any deep learning model. Now, one-hot vectors are fine if you have a small vocabulary of symbols, like seven nodes. But if you want to model 100,000 words, you're using a lot of memory that is mostly filled with zeros. An alternative method is to use embedding vectors. The idea here is that you assign each input symbol in your vocabulary a vector of random values. You then translate a symbolic input sequence into a sequence of vectors by mapping the input symbols to their corresponding embedding vectors. The dimensionality of the embedding vectors is a hyperparameter, but it's usually set somewhere between 64 and 1024. The fundamental trick of embedding vectors is that we treat these as parameters of the model. We feed this input sequence into a model, and we'll describe what that looks like later. We compute the loss, and we backpropagate, and then we get gradients on all parameters of the model, including these embedding vectors. As we train, these vectors become useful representations of our words in some high dimensional space. Embedding vectors occur in many contexts, not just sequence learning, so we'll define them a little bit more broadly. In any setting where you have a large collection of discrete objects and no features for these objects, you can represent them with embedding vectors. You assign a unique vector to each object in your set and use these vectors to represent the objects you want to learn over. If you're training on a sequence of objects, you turn this sequence of objects into a sequence of embedding vectors and feed that to your model. Once you've computed your loss, you update the values of the embedding vectors by gradient descent, possibly using backpropagation to compute the gradients. And we can think of the embeddings as learned features. We don't have features for our objects, so we simply assign them some random features and then tweak the values of those by gradient descent. In addition to training embeddings together with the other parameters of our model, embeddings also provide a good opportunity for pre-training. If we have a large amount of unlabeled text available, and we can think of a cheap way to use it to train word embeddings, 
we can then reuse these word embeddings in larger, more elaborate models. We'll take a quick look at the word to vec model as an example. We start with some large corpus, a dataset of natural language. And from this, we create a very simple dataset by sliding a window of, say, five words along the text and matching the word in the middle to the four words that occur to the left and to the right of it. So here we see, for instance, that at the start of the data, the words occurring in the context of the word compare are shall, I, thee, and to. Our task now is to predict for a given input word x the distribution of words likely to appear in its context windows throughout the text. And we model this very simply by creating embedding vectors for all of the words in our vocabulary. We then feed the embedding vector for x to a single layer neural network with one output for every word in our vocabulary and with a softmax activation. If we have 100,000 words in our vocabulary, then we can think of this as a one-layer classification network with 100,000 classes and the embeddings as input features. We train both the embedding and the weights of the network together. If training is successful, then the output distribution matches what we see in the data, and we know that our embedding vectors now contain the information about which words are likely to appear in their context. The embedding vector for the word compare should now contain the information that words like the and to are likely to appear next to it. And the basic idea is that this information captures a lot of the meaning of the word. This is sometimes called the distributional hypothesis. The idea that the meaning of a word is captured by the words it occurs together with. Note that the softmax activation over 100,000 outputs is very expensive to compute, and you need some clever tricks to make this feasible. We won't, however, go into them here. If we train embedding vectors like this on a large corpus and investigate what they look like after training, we can tease out some interesting properties. For instance, it seems like there is a direction in the resulting embedding space that, if we move along this direction, pushes male words towards their female counterparts. What's more, if we then add this vector to the embedding vector for the word king and look at which embedding vector is closest to the result, it's the embedding vector for the word queen. Compare this with the smiling vector we saw in the autoencoder lecture. word to vec is not an autoencoder, but we are learning a similar kind of latent space model. These are the most important things to consider when representing an input sequence so that deep learning models can understand it. We need to somehow translate our input to a sequence of vectors, and we then need to combine sequences of similar length into batches, which are padded so that the lengths within the batch are the same. If our input is a sequence of symbols, we can translate this to a sequence of vectors by mapping the symbols to one-hot vectors if the vocabulary is small, or mapping the symbols to embedding vectors if the vocabulary is larger. And finally, pre-training your embedding methods can be a useful way of performing semi-supervised learning using a large amount of unlabeled data to boost the performance of your model on labeled data. Now that we know what our input looks like, we need to know what to feed it to. So the next step is to define sequence-to-sequence -sequence layers. These are layers that take as their input a sequence of length t of vectors and produce as their output another sequence of vectors of the same length. The output dimension may be different from the input dimension, but the length of the sequence stays the same. The defining property of a sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer is that they can consume sequences of different lengths with the same set of weights. In one iteration of gradient descent, we can feed the layer a sequence of five words, get a loss and update its weights. And in the next iteration, we can feed it a sequence of 15 words and get a loss and get a gradient on the same set of weights. To illustrate that principle, let's look at some examples and see whether they are sequence-to-sequence -sequence layers or not. For instance, here we see a fully connected layer. We have an input sequence of five vectors, each containing four, each containing four numbers, and an output sequence also of five vectors, each containing four numbers. So we could build a fully connected layer here, simply connecting each of the 20 input values to each of the 20 output values giving us 400 weights. This is not a sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer. Why not? Well, imagine that the next instance has six vectors. We wouldn't be able to feed it to this layer 
without adding extra weights. In short, the number of tokens in the input and output sequence is hard-coded into the network. This network also applies a fully connected layer, but only applies it to each vector in isolation. This gives us 4x4 four four connections per vector and 80 connections in total, but these 80 connections share only 16 unique weights, which are repeated at each step. Now this is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer. If the next instance has six vectors, we can simply repeat the same MLP again, and we won't need any extra weights. That's the basic idea of the sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer. If we see an input with a given length, we can take the layer, keep the weights the same, but configure the layer to accept a sequence of the required length. Of course, the second option may be technically a sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer, but it doesn't actually learn over the time dimension. The value of the fifth output vector is in no way influenced by the values of input vectors 1 through 4, because there are no connections between them. Luckily, there is a layer that we've seen already that is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer and allows for information to be propagated along the time dimension. This is the 1D convolution that we saw in the first deep learning lecture. Note that the number of distinct weights in this layer depends only on the size of the kernel and the number of input and output channels. If we see a longer or shorter sequence, we just repeat the same kernel more often, but we don't need any extra weights. All we need to do to fit this to our definition of a sequence layer is to add a little extra padding so that the input and the output have the same length. Note that even though we are now allowing information to propagate from one position in the input to another position in the output, we're only allowing this over a finite distance. This is a little bit like the finite memory of the Markov model. We can use the history and future of the sequence, but only a fixed, finite part of it. In the next video, we'll look at some sequence-to-sequence -sequence models that don't have this limitation. In many settings, it's not actually reasonable to let the model look into the future. For instance, when you only have information from the future for your training data, but you don't expect to have it in production. In that case, it's important to wire up your sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer so that each output node only has connections to the corresponding input node and to the ones before it, but not to the ones after it. This is called a causal sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer. And pictured here is a causal convolution. Note that the use of the word causal doesn't imply that we're performing causal inference. That is, we're not making guaranteed distinctions between correlation and causation, as we discussed in the social impact videos. It's simply a way of ensuring that the model can see into the future. The word causal is applied here in an informal sense. The convolution layer is hopefully enough to give you a concrete idea of what a sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer might look like. In the next video, we'll see another way of building sequence-to-sequence -sequence layers. For now, we'll move on to the output. We have an input format, a sequence of vectors, and a type of layer which translates a sequence of vectors to another sequence of vectors. So finally, we need to give our network some output, something that allows it to compute a single loss so that we can start our backpropagation. There's a number of ways we can configure our model, depending on exactly what we're trying to achieve. Here are three basic configurations we may want to build. We may want our data as a whole to map an input sequence to an output sequence, but we may also want a sequence to label model, for instance, if we're doing sequence classification. And finally, there are some settings where we want to take a single vector as an input and generate a sequence. We'll look at all of these in detail. A sequence-to-sequence -sequence task is probably the simplest setup. Both our input and our targets consist of sequences. In this case, we can simply create a model by stacking a number of sequence-to-sequence -sequence layers, giving us intermediate sequences, and computing our loss as the difference between the output sequence and the target sequence. We sum the loss over all tokens in the sequence and backpropagate. To see how this works in detail, here's a concrete example. We want to tag each word in a sentence with its grammatical category. This is known as part of speech tagging. All we need is a large collection of sentences for which the words have been tagged already. We start by converting the symbols in our input sequence to positive integers. This sequence of integers is fed to an embedding layer which gives us a sequence of embedding vectors, 
And note that we have to decide beforehand what the size of our vocabulary is. If we keep a vocabulary of 10,000 tokens, then the embedding layer will create 10,000 embedding vectors for us. Now that we have a sequence of embedding vectors, we can feed this to a stack of sequence-to-sequence -sequence layers, which culminate in a sequence of vectors with as many elements as we have part of speech tags. If we apply a softmax activation over these vectors, we can interpret them as probabilities on the part of speech tags. Since we know the correct part of speech tags, we can compute the logarithmic loss, and this we can backpropagate to train the weights of our sequence-to-sequence -sequence layers and the contents of our embedding vectors. In the rest of the lecture, we will omit the embedding layer, assuming that some suitable input representation has been chosen. One more interesting thing we can build with a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model is an autoregressive model. We feed the model some sequence, and we set the target as the same sequence, but shifted one token to the left. We then feed the input through several causal layers, ensuring that the network can only look backwards in the sequence. The final output sequence we apply a softmax to, and we interpret it as a probability distribution on the output characters, and we compute the log loss and train by backpropagation. This effectively trains the model to produce a probability distribution for the next character in the sequence at every point in the sequence. At point 1 we get a probability distribution on the next character given that the preceding character is h. At point 2 we get a probability distribution on the next character given that the preceding characters are h and e, and so on for all points in the sequence. After the network is trained, we can use it for sequential sampling. We start as before with a small seed sequence of tokens, we feed these to the network, and we look at the last vector in the output and interpret it as a probability distribution on what the next character following this sequence will be. We sample a token from this distribution, append it to the seed, and we iterate. Note that again here we have no Markov assumption, so no matter how long the seed grows, we can keep feeding the whole seed to the network, letting it look potentially infinitely far back in the sequence. We'll see some examples of data generated this way after we've explained LSTM networks in the next video. So that's what we can do with a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. If we have a sequence labeling task, like the email spam classification we saw earlier, we need to construct a model that consumes sequences of variable lengths but at some stage reduces them down to a single label, like a class probability vector. In that case, the input and the output of our network look like this. We have an input sequence, but we have a single target. So the output of our network should be a single vector, which we can compare to the target to compute the loss. We can start as before by applying sequence-to-sequence -sequence layers to produce intermediate sequences and finally an output sequence. But at some point, we need to reduce this output sequence to a single vector. We call this global pooling, and there are several operations that can do this for us. We can simply sum or average all the vectors in the output sequence, but we can also apply the max pooling that we saw in convolutional neural networks and apply it not locally as we did then, but globally to the whole sequence. Note that this pooling operation needs to work for inputs of variable length, so something like a multi-layer perceptron would not work here. An alternative idea is simply to take one of the vectors in the output sequence and use that as the output vector and ignore the rest. If we train the neural network to classify only based on this output, it will hopefully learn to put the right information into this output vector. If you have causal sequence-to-sequence -sequence layers, it's important that you use the last vector, since that's the only one that gets to see the whole input sequence. For some layers, like the recurrent ones we'll see in the next video, this kind of this kind of approach puts more weight on the end of the sequence, since the early nodes have to propagate through more intermediate steps in the sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer. For others, all inputs in the sequence are treated equally, and there is little difference between using a global unit or a pooling layer. Finally, if we want to train a generative model on sequences, we may want to start with a label, for instance a latent vector, or a representation of the type of thing we want to generate, and map that to an output sequence. The simplest way to achieve this is just to take your input vector and to repeat it into a sequence of the same vector over and over again. 
For some layers like recurrent ones, there are other ways to feed a single vector to the input sequence, but we'll save that for the next video. So that's the general view of how we apply deep learning to sequences. We view our input as a sequence of vectors. We build our models primarily as a stack of sequence-to-sequence -sequence layers. And if we have a sequence labeling task, then we need to apply global pooling or select a global unit to reduce from a sequence to a single vector. We've seen one sequence-to-sequence -sequence layer already, the 1D convolution. In the next video, we'll add another one to our toolkit, the recurrent neural network.